Ray, you and I typically get together and we get to talk about the amazing evangelistic work that you do. And over the years, that's how I've gotten to know you is getting to work with you in that regard. But there's another subject that's part of our faith that I think sometimes is either overlooked or overemphasized depending on who you're dealing with. But I've had a focus of feeling like this issue of evil, the spiritual evil, is sometimes ignored. You know, as an evangelist, why is it important that we have a healthy understanding of what this spiritual evil actually consists of? Well, I like that word healthy because you're right. There is excess and uh, abuse when it comes to the whole thought of uh, exorcism and um, demons. But the Bible is full of it, especially the Gospels. Jesus was casting out demons all over the place, speaking to them, asking for the name of legion. Uh, Paul in Ephesians says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He said, We wanted to do this, preach the gospel to the, to the Thessalonians. He said, But Satan hindered us. And so, and also, Jesus said, These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. So, this isn't something that's unbiblical. It's something that's fantastic in the truest sense of the word. It just seems like fantasy, it doesn't seem real but we know it's real, both from Scripture and from experience. Well, and it's also interesting because culture, and I find this fascinating, is absolutely obsessed with these issues, right? I mean, Hollywood churns out, and they're not doing it from a biblical perspective 99.9% .9 of the time, but movie after movie about, you know, ghosts, and I'll put that in quotes, ghosts and demons. And you know, this is a topic, I think, because people... A, they're curious about it, but B, people have experienced things that they can't explain. And so it's sort of fed this intrigue, even in the secular world. Um, but but I want to ask, because you, one of your many books, your book, Out of the Comfort Zone, you know, you and I had talked offline and you said, hey, I want you to check out, you know, chapter 10 in this book. And, you know, I went back to the book and read chapter 10, and really it recounts some of your experiences early on in ministry where you were dealing with spiritual evil. And I love the way you wrote it. I thought it was incredible sort of journeying through your lens, what you experienced. But one of the stories was about this man named John, and you were at a youth church camp, you were speaking there, and he came to you. T tell us a little bit about what he had to say and what you experienced with him. Yeah, um, this happened 40 years ago. It was like the last century. And uh, I had to read the book, too, to remember exactly what happened, because I want to get it right. And I'd like to say there's no exaggerations on my part. I believe all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Liars won't inherit the kingdom of God. And so I'm very careful to, to not to exaggerate and to speak the truth. But I was at a youth camp. This is uh, just a couple of uh, these incidents in the book of a, a number that happened to me. But I was at a youth camp. A young guy named John came to my cabin and he said, I've got some problems. Can I talk with you? And so he sat on the bunk and we began to talk. And I think I said, I'd pray, I'll pray for you in a minute. And as I began to pray, he slumped onto the floor on his back and back arched on his back and began sliding across the room and screaming and groaning and having a spirit of perception. I perceived this was not normal human behavior. So I began to pray, exercising prayer. And demons began to manifest. And afterwards, uh, some guy come to the room and he said, because he heard the noise, and I said, go and get a drink of water for John. And he came back to himself because he was in a blackout state. And I said, John, what have you been into to get like this? And he said he had been listening to heavy uh, occultic rock music and drinking blood, which isn't kind of normal. <laughs> and him and his girlfriend under the influence of marijuana would go to a butcher and get blood and drink it. And it's because Satanism and the occult is all founded upon rebellion, a rebellion against God and against everything good and wholesome. And God says blood is sacred, so they drink blood to desecrate it. Um, God loves children, says let the children come to me. They sacrifice children. God says cover the human body, so they have their satanic rituals naked often and so it's all founded on rebellion and that's what he had been into and that's what had opened the door to demons so i i have a number of questions here the first one being you know here you are I, i'm sure you're thinking you're going to have a normal conversation with this guy with john about what he's going through when he collapsed to the floor and started moving around the room 
what was going through your mind and your heart in the in those moments as you were watching that unfold? Well, I, got, I missed out one detail. Saliva from his mouth was coming out with such velocity, it was hitting a chest of drawers at least six or eight feet from him. It was just weird. Um, what was going through my mind is, yikes, what is happening? Because I'm in, I live in a natural world. If you think it sounds fantastic, think of me. I was right in the middle of like a horror movie. Uh, but I'd experienced it before in other instances, so I knew what to do, and I knew it was biblical, and um, and so I was able to keep my my brain from going getting fried. But it really is it is quite horrific if you look at it naturally without the knowledge that God is with you. Well, and and you know the thing about this too that the Hollywood movies this is sort of where they leave it a lot of times, right? That the evil wins, the person is overtaken, and you know chaos ensues, and yet. In this case, you said a prayer, an, an exercising prayer um, in this moment. Talk a little bit about that, because I think one thing people don't realize is that there, there is an ability to heal and beat this through Jesus, right? Oh, absolutely. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Uh, I don't believe a Christian can be demonically possessed. He can be oppressed. The Apostle Paul spoke of Satan uh, sending an angel, an angel of Satan to buffered him. And so we all have battles with demonic forces, with thoughts in our head. But um, when someone becomes a Christian, they are set free. And I've got to say this so everyone gets it in perspective what we're talking about. All these things happened 40 years ago. I haven't prayed exercising prayer for 40 years. I don't have a deliverance ministry. And that's because in 1982, I had a revelation. And this was a revelation, and we can talk about it later if you wish. But the Bible says, submit to God resist the devil and he will flee from you. And if Satan isn't fleeing from someone, I believe it's probably because they're not totally submitted to God. And this is why mm. often people that I've prayed exercising prayer for some time, when I've spoken to them, they've got bitterness in their heart or anger or resentment towards their parents. Um, that's one way to get spiritual problems is to hate your father, hate your mother. Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, Honor your father and mother that all may be well with you and your days may be long upon the earth. We're commanded to honor our parents. And if you hate your father, that's opening the door to demons. The apostle Paul spoke of having bitterness in your heart. And then he says, but we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Bitterness can give a stronghold to the enemy. And so we should not give place to the devil. That's what the Bible says. Give no place to the devil. If the devil has place, we're giving it to him. Remember, Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That word may is a word of permission. It's not a word. It's just a, it means permission. If you are in Satan's territory, if you're lying or stealing or looking at porn or blaspheming and doing things you know are morally wrong, you're opening the door. You're giving foothold to the devil. And so it's very, very important. This is what changed everything. It's very important that someone has a genuine conversion that they're confronted with the moral law, the Ten Commandments, as Jesus confronted sinners. So they see what sin is. Sin is lust. It's committing adultery in the heart. It's lying and stealing and blasphemy and dishonoring your parents. Once someone truly repents, they submit to God, resist the devil, he flees from them. We have victory over them. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. So that's the victory you have against the spiritual darkness. So I have two questions off of that, because let's talk about John really quickly. You know, based on your experience with him, would you have seen what he was going through as an oppression or a possession? What would what was your take on what was? Boy, I, I really don't know, because way back then I didn't have the knowledge I have now about genuine repentance and closing the door. But I know that there are a lot of particularly young people that have come under the sound of the, the uh, modern gospel, which says, give your heart to Jesus. He'll fix your problems. That leaves the door open for the enemy because there's no crying out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's no genuine repentance. There's no godly sorrow, which brings about repentance. So that's why so many young people have so many problems spiritually, because they're not brought to a place of genuine repentance and faith in Christ. And, and what you said there is really interesting, because, you know, I talk to a lot of different people with different viewpoints on all of these terms, right? You bring up the term exorcism, deliverance. Everybody has a different definition of what they think these things mean. And some people react. It's just like with the rapture, right? You talk about the rapture and people get either really worked up or really excited about it, depending on who you're talking to. With deliverance, 
I almost feel like that term is the new rapture in terms of it's a new thing. It's not a new thing, but it's a thing people are fighting about now. They're arguing about it within the church and there's deliverance ministries. There are films coming out showing it. And then there are people who would say, you don't need to go through deliverance. You you have a genuine repentance, right? Everything you just talked about, that's not needed. If you're truly you know, making the devil flee and you're fleeing from him, you're not going to have to worry about it. I don't want to get you in trouble, but I am curious to know on I'm that I'm already front, in trouble. I you're am already in, in trouble. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you stand on that deliverance from? And you know, when I say deliverance, I mean the ministries that are centered on giving Christians in particular deliverance. Yeah, like you said, if you want to split a church, just stand up and say, let's talk about prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same with this whole deliverance thing. All I can say is this is from experience. I found myself at churches after I'd preached praying for people for hours. And I found it utterly exhausting until I understood that that person has to close the door themselves. Otherwise, you're going to get, remember, um, the, Jesus told a story about a demon that went off and came back was seven times worse because he found the door open again. So that door has to be closed. And that's what I usually, if someone has demonic problems, I say, well, let, let's go through the gospel. Let's see what sin is. And then you renounce everything you've been into. Turn from it. Say, God, I'm totally yours. I give myself. I submit myself to your lordship. I present myself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to you, which is my reasonable service. And that's when you're a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. All things become new. Yeah. No, and I, I think that's I think that's really powerful. And there are some who would say, well, that's kind of a form of deliverance. Right? Again, it's a spectrum, this this notion of what deliverance is. But you mentioned you know something there that I thought was interesting. People coming back obviously seven times worse than they were before if they if they don't turn away. And there was another story, and I would encourage people to grab out of the comfort zone, read this book, you know, really fascinating. But this other story was about these two girls who had come to you for help when you were in New Zealand. One of the girls you named Jane um, in the book. This story, I mean, one of the quotes is that she was, quote, crawling on her knees, gro on her hands and knees, groaning, screaming, and making animal-like noises, that, that you witnessed this. And that's just not even the tip of the iceberg of what you saw. Take us through her story, because I do think there's so many layers to it that I think speak to what you were just saying. Yeah. First, I'd say Out of the Comfort Zone isn't about exorcism. It's just one chapter. It's a very sure. exciting, true story that will uh, encourage you. So um, I used to preach in the in the square in Christchurch, New Zealand. It was the heart of the city of 350,000 people. I did that every day for about 12 years, almost every day. One day, I just finished preaching, and two girls came up to me, and they looked embarrassed. And I said, can we talk to you about something? And I just said, is it about demons? And they were shocked and said, yes, we think it is, because one of the girls, Jane, kept having blackouts. And I said, well, come up to my office at 2 o'clock, and we'll talk. And I had us five stories up, and I used to uh, have something called the Drug Prevention Center, which was originally on High Street, which is an unfortunate choice of street <laughs> names for a drug center, High Street. And we moved to this big dome building five stories up, and I said, come up and see me. So she came up. She came into my office, and we talked for a few minutes, and I said, and she said she had problems, and she hated her father and stuff like that. I says, I'll come back and pray for you because a customer had walked into the drug prevention center. While I was talking to the customer, her friend ran out crying and screaming out that Jane was manifesting. She'd gone into a blackout state and she was crawling on her hands and knees. Like you said, that customer left really quickly. And uh, I went in and, and began talking with Jane and uh, praying, exercising prayer and uh, telling her that she needed to get right with God and that she should get rid of her trinket. She was having, she had these demonic looking things on it, particularly one thing that caught my eye. It would look like Tinkerbell in the Peter Pan thing it was like a little fairy that she had around. It just looked like, I didn't have a clue what it was, but it just felt like what a goddess of fertility or something weird like that. So I said, get rid of that. And she felt free. And uh, two weeks later, I received a phone call from a friend and said, Jane is having blackouts again. Can we come and see you? And it turned out she hadn't become a Christian and she hadn't got rid of that trinket. But I went, <laughs> I went to my office and waited for them. And, uh, a friend screamed out that Jane had gone into a blackout state halfway up the stairs. And I went down and she was leaning against the wall in a back, back out, blackout state. So I went to take hold of her and put my hand on her arm and she ran ahead of me. And I'm not exaggerating here. She threw herself over a balcony. It was like a, 
a 15 or 20 foot drop onto a wooden floor. And I instinctively ran after her and tackled her. And I had her around the leg. She was wearing jeans and she was over bell. I don't know how I held on to her. I knew I had my life, her life in my hands. And I screamed out to two friends who were in the drug prevention center to come and help. And we physically carried her to my office, sat her down, and she was in a blackout state, sitting down in my office, manifesting all these different weird demons. And at one point, and the dexterity was quite amazing. With one hand, she reached into a blouse and pulled out a safety pin and under the safety pin and tried to swallow it. I think three times she grabbed cords from, uh, from lights in the office and tried to strangle herself. And uh, the demon screamed out, we're going to kill. And I said, you can't touch us because we're Christians. And he said, not you, her. And uh, it was quite horrific, but it climaxed in this. I saw that she was holding onto something around her neck and her knuckles had lost all the blood out of them. They were white. She was holding on so tight. So I opened up a hand. It took me at least 30 seconds with both my hands to open it up. And I saw it was the little Tinkerbell thing. I grabbed it, walked across the other side of the room. And I used to make leather jackets in those days for people to order. And there was an anvil, like a little bit of a railway track sitting on my desk. I got a hammer, put that trinket on it. I had my back to Jane. She had her eyes closed. These two friends were standing between me and her. And this is no exaggerating. Every time I hit the hammer on that little trinket, the demons and her screamed like you wouldn't believe. I hit it five times. And each time to the very second I hit that trinket with a hammer, the demons and her screamed. I scooped them up, opened the window and threw them down five stories. But it, if you're thinking this is fantastic, hard to believe, again, think of me I'm right in the middle of a horror movie that I couldn't believe was happening. Wow. And, and you know, you, you read these stories and you hear them, you, I'm hearing you tell the story and I'm thinking, I can't imagine what it was like to be there in it. And did she eventually find healing and accept the Lord? Yes. And also during that time, we had to stop her from trying to gouge her eyes out. Seriously, getting her fingers in her eyes. It was terrible. Um, yes, uh, she came to, uh, I said, what you have to do, Jane, is renounce, and I named the demon that, she, that had a stronghold in her life, and this time she wanted to become a Christian. She got rid of all the trinkets, and when she left, she was free. I think she, yeah, she came into the center the next day, and she was bruised, but she didn't remember a thing from being blacked out through that whole oh. episode. Not a thing. And she was completely free, and I haven't heard of from her for about 40 years. You know, it is, so hearing you talk about this, because you were saying these exorcist, you know, these prayers of exorcism, these exercising prayers, and you said you haven't done that now um, since the early 80s. Would there ever be a moment in time where you would do that again? Or do you really feel as though your understanding of this has changed and it's more about the renouncing, the person renouncing these things themselves? Yeah, I, I know if some guy was going to attack me with a knife, he's running at me, I'd say I rebuke, I would say I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I'd call on Jesus' name because I know it's power. Jesus said, rejoice not because demons are subject to you, but rejoice because your name is written in heaven. And they are subject to the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. But one of the reasons, another reason I don't want to go out of my way to have an exercising or uh, deliverance ministry is because... After that incident, I would speak at different churches and the same demons would manifest at the altar, the same names. And it began to freak me out. I thought, I don't want to spend my whole life chasing demons. Or having, they can chase me if they want, but I'm not going to chase them. And so it's been, uh, it's been freeing up for me to understand what true repentance is and the slamming of the door is. And uh, you said before about Hollywood, they, they love the darkness. They're, uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not, least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ is. The image of God should shine to them. They don't realize what they're involved in. You know, they say things like, he had his demons. What does that mean? It's a common saying. And we know we take that literally. Yes, and they say other things like, as sure as hell. And we know hell is sure. We know this world is very, very real. Their minds are blinded, and the only way to reach them is with the glorious light of the gospel. When they hear the gospel, it opens the understanding. And that and that's where you focus so wonderfully, you know, for so many years now. And I, I want to ask you before we round out here, 
to a close about young people, because right now we're seeing, I mean, I, I had survey data recently that was so shocking and I brought this up a few times, but I'm going to bring it up again because it was so alarming. I think it was 43% of young people between the ages of 13 and 25 are using crystals or tarot cards at least once a month. And so we're seeing this explosion of the occult. It's being normalized in Hollywood more than ever. And it's everything from the Ouija board down the line. What do you think about that? What, how do Christians respond to that? Uh, one thing I forgot to mention about Jane, <clears throat> she was terrified of the whole demonic world because her and a friend once used a Ouija board. And the Ouija board said that her friend who was 12 years old was going to be killed in a car accident. This terrified that 12-year-old, and she wouldn't even get in a car. Two years later, a car came up on a sidewalk and killed her. And this terrified Jane after what had happened. So you're playing with fire when you're playing with demons, and we need to do what the Bible says and stay away from those works and of works of darkness. <clears throat> We're coming up to Halloween. Halloween uh, freaked me out when I came to the U.S. Came to the U.S. back in 1989. We went to the local Kmart, and I couldn't believe all these images and clothings that were just so demonic. It was just like walking into a horror factory or something. And so for, for the first two or three years, when it came to Halloween, this is no kidding, Sue and I would take our children and turn the lights off and sit there watching TV in the dark and ignoring people that came to our door because we didn't want to have anything to do with Halloween. And then one day I got the revelation, hang on, Sinners are coming to my door. Why don't I open it and give them a gospel tract? You know, there's something weird about having to go to sinners' houses and knock on their door, but they're coming to my door. So the first, first year that we did it, we gave out over 100 gospel tracts to people that came to my door and received gifts. So for the last 30 or so years, our ministry has seen Halloween as being evangelism day of the year. That's what we really? see it as. It's the day, it's the it's the darkest night, and that's when the light shines the best. So we have what's called a Halloween pack that we make av available. It's very, very popular. It has the most popular tracks to give to people who come to your door and they can't resist them. But let me take it a little further if I've got time. If you want people to come to your door, leave your light on. Put some balloons up so they feel welcomed. Even put a table out there with gifts on and gospel tracks to give to people. But take it even further. If you're a church and you want to see growth in that church, I've got a great idea because I was a pastor for three and a half years, the time of tribulation, and I know what it's like to go and visit strangers as a pastor, to knock on their door, say, hi, we're from the local church. And you know they're thinking he's after our money, and it's just <laughs> awkward. But... And this one night of the year, because of the evil times in which we live, you'll see parents walking with their kids around the streets because they don't want them going up to strangers' houses by themselves. So this is one night of the year when you can meet your local neighborhood without having to knock on their door. So if you're a local church, get a table, a big table, put it on the sidewalk or by the sidewalk in front of a church, laden it with gifts and gospel tracts, all sorts of gifts, candy or whatever, even meals and sandwiches, whatever, so that when your neighborhood come to you, you can give them gifts, say, hi, how you doing? What's your kid's name? Here's a gift for your kids. And you're going to break down every barrier there is. Scripture says, for so is the will of God that by your well-doing, you'll put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You'll silence their mouth. No longer will you be seen as a money-grabbing uh, religious organization, but you're a light in the darkness because they've met you in your grounds and your territory, and you've shown them love. And it's a wonderful night that you can reach the lost. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting perspective on it because there are a lot of people who would say you shouldn't participate at all. Any participation is wrong. If you hand out candy, I mean, like let's say you put the tracks out with candy or you hand out the candy with tracks. Is that something in your view that would be a great thing to do? You know, you're mixing the candy in, so you're doing that, but you're really, your goal is to evangelize. Is that an okay thing to mix? Absolutely. It wasn't for me for the first three years until I saw the potential. Paul says, by all means, reach some all means. And so we use Thanksgiving, we use Independence Day, we've got different tracks for all these days of the year, and we take advantage of it because we know on the 4th of July, people are on, on the streets for parades. So we've got a 4th of July gospel track to Patriot uh, million dollar bill. We've got a Halloween million dollar bill designed to reach the lost. And remember Paul in Athens, which we've once talked about before, he stood up on 
in, in, in Athens when they were given to idolatry, and he quoted Greek poets, sinful, probably adulterous Greek poets. He quoted them. What was he partaking in their wickedness by quoting? No, he was using them as a springboard to reach the lost. And that's all we do with, with Labor Day, with uh, Halloween, Thanksgiving. We use the, and Christmas, which you mentioned Christmas, if you want to split a church, you know, <laughs> Jesus wasn't born on the 20th, oh, you know, and it's just like a can of worms every time you say anything in a local church, but here's a wonderful opportunity. So people are going to hell. We've got everlasting life as a gift for them. We should take advantage of this opportunity and reach out with the, with the gospel. Where can people go? Because you you mentioned and you showed the Halloween, you know, pack that you guys have. I know you have so many other evangelistic tools. Where can people go to get all that? They can go to livingwaters.com. We've highlighted our Halloween pack for this year. Uh, out of the comfort zones available wherever good books are sold. We also have, um, you can see spiritual things happening on our YouTube channel. YouTube channel's just passed 261 million views. We've got two channels. One's called Just Witnessing, and the other one is Living Waters or Ray Comfort uh, YouTube. And you can actually see demonic manifestations there, very subtle ones, where I s explain how... When the gospel is preached, watch this person's eyes when the gospel is preached. And you see them get distracted, and I have to pull them back and say, concentrate, because the God of this world is blind to the minds of those that believe. So I want you to listen to what I'm saying. And it's, uh, it's quite enlightening to see it actually happening before your eyes. Well, I appreciate you and your ministry, and as always, giving me your time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you talking about this issue. It's so important.